All right, and welcome back. Now we're going to focus on how to actually run one of these analyses, starting in R. So first thing I've loaded here is the party package that helps us do this analysis. And then the rest of this just tells me what all has been loaded with party. And it is a party of packages. Look at all these libraries and it's open. All right, the data set here. We'll use this data set several times. It is a data set that thinks about um, uh, category instances of certain verbs. So what is it that makes us use make, have, or cause different from each other? And these are causative constructions. And then there's kind of special verbs that are um, never used alone <laughs> in, in the sense that we're going to talk about them. Like you can make lunch, right? But um, this is sets where it's make verb, have verb, or cause verb. Okay. And so they're always paired with another instance of a verb. The independent variables we're going to use are weirdly worded in this data set, but basically it's the semanticity, meaning the meaning of the actor in the sentence. So if I said, I made him paint my house, okay, um, I am an animate actor because I think in our brief. Uh, semanticity of the actee made him, he's also animate. Uh, it could be the type of event, mental, physical, or social. I guess it's physical. Painting is very physical. Okay. The If it's negative or not, so I have not, right? If it's a co-reference, meaning you did the thing to you, so it's not, I made him paint the house, or I made myself take a nap. <laughs> that would be a co-reference, right? And is it possessive or not? So what people did was they had a whole bunch of sentences that had either make, have, or cause in them, and they coded them for all of these things. Back to my example of formatting one's website, we could have a whole bunch of pictures of our different products, and we could code them for different key features that we think might be important. And so you could code them easily as yes, no, and see if those features are predictive, right? Now, this data is in the causative data set. All this right here is to simply drop the other verbs. So there are actually more verbs in this causative constructions data set than these three, but we're gonna focus on these three. Okay. And the example for class or for the assignment we're gonna use is when, when do people use geek? And when do people use nerd? Because they have distinct separations. All right, so we're just gonna drop out every, we're gonna take only these pieces and then I dropped levels so it wouldn't think that there were more options to come that were empty categories. So now we've got a reduced data set that has just the three verbs we're interested in. Cool. Now we're going to set C to start with a random number, although I have found that it doesn't really matter because it tends to give me the same results every single time, but you know, it says that you're supposed to set with seed, so I did it. Now let's build a tree. So the function for tree is C tree for conditional inference tree. And then hopefully if you've you know, been paying attention in other classes, this will look familiar, but check this out right here. This is the same type of equation that one might write for linear regression. And so this is read as Y is predicted by X. So the type of verb is predicted by these two different types of actor and actee in the sentence, the type of event, the, is it negative, is it a co-reference, and is it possessive? Okay, so hopefully this is left over somewhere in the cobwebs of your brain from the linear regression class. And you do have to put in data. So I'm gonna save my output because the output all by itself is not that handy. But if I tell it to plot the tree, that's really useful. Now, unfortunately, when it prints out on these slides, it never really, um, maybe make it bigger. I make it smaller. It never really usefully shows, whoa, way too big. The, um, the whole table here, it's a little frustrating. If you print it in R, which I don't have open the slides, um, if you print this out in R Studio, you can make this figure bigger and you can see which ones they are. Okay. But well, let's look at what's going on here. So what happens is it picks the variable it can split with the highest uh, effect size. So 
the first big split is based on the semanticity of the actor. And so there are inanimate actors and there are animate actors. From there, it splits on the semanticity of the event. Now do note that each side can have a totally different path. So this one over here could have been um, co-reference next. So this level being the same is just because that, uh, that variable is important, not because they have to be the same on each side, because clearly they aren't. Okay, so once you split this over here, what's the, in the inanimate data set, so this literally splits the data. In the inanimate data set, what happens? The semanticity of the event is important. It will always do a binary split, so we don't get three parts here, but we get mental and physical, I'm sorry, mental compared to physical and social. So what's happening? In an inanimate situation, so the actor of the sentence is inanimate, the rock has faded in the sun. Okay. Um, wait, have verb, sorry, has faded, faded, faded's a verb. Oh, I'm questioning my linguistic knowledge, but let's go with this, ha has faded, right? Because <laughs> that's a verb, meaning get lighter in color, okay. Um, in a mental scenario, we're more likely to pick whatever this one is over here. In a physical and social scenario, which I guess this is physical, right? We're more likely to pick cause here. Um, so I think it's, it's an alphabetical order. So cause, have, and then make. So this one's make, and this one's cause. So I have neither example. <laughs> I neither have a match what I just picked, but, um, we are more likely to have a mental event if you're gonna use have, make, and more likely to have a physical or social event if you say cause. Okay. And so that kind of makes some sense because maybe in a social event, we caused um, the rock caused me to fall down the stairs, okay? Um, <clears throat> and so we would see that these are splitting based on these different categories. Okay, so how does this relate back to categories? These are the category instances and these are their features. And this will tell us which features go with which category. All right, if I go the other way, I've got animate actors, it then separates in a different way. Mental and physical events are all three. So this is where the fuzzy boundary comes in. All three of these overlap and there's no one winner here. They're all equally likely. However, for social events, it's gonna split one more time based on the animacy of the act E, the thing being acted upon, the direct object in the sentence usually. Okay. And then we've got one winner for have and one very strong winner for make. But have being kind of large in both of these, I'm sorry, this is make, this middle one is have here in the middle. Okay. The fact that make has two different options tells you a little bit about probabilities and categories, right? There are two different probable scenarios. And so there are different types of exemplars that exist. Okay? Whereas cause and, ha and um, have have clear winners. And so you'd interpret this by just slowly breaking down the tree, which I've got here on the next couple slides. So this tree includes all possible splits that were significant at P less than 0.05. That's just the cutoff that it uses. You can change this. The ovals are the names of the variables with the best split. The topmost one was the most important and then further down. Okay. The splits are shown on the branches on how it split up those categories. And the bottom bar chart tells us what number of instances occurred in each split. So you'd look for one with the highest probability and that's the one that it would predict in that split. So very similar to a decision tree, this would be the like um, the classification you would give that object. The first split in our example is between animate and inanimate actor. This says inanimate twice, animate and inanimate actors. Okay, so either um, living, breathing creatures and things that don't move. The next split is on the semanticity of the event. So what type of thing is going on in the sentence? And then on the left side, that split is mental versus physical and social. And so make appears to be featurely comprised of mental inanimate events. So I, it made me think of him. 
Okay. Oh, that's that's animate. Um, mental inanimate events. Hold on, I'm gonna make sure. Mental inanimate. Yes. Okay. Uh, how do you have a mental inanimate event? <laughs> so, mental inanimate events. Hmm. Make. Hmm. <laughs> trying to think. The rock made me think. <laughs> I'm like gonna try to come up with an inanimate event. Okay, well, that's what I got. So uh, that's my best example I've got right now. And I've taught this lecture a hundred times. I can't come up with an example at the moment, but cause appears to be comprised of physical or social inanimate events. Okay, so um, inanimate actors, if you will. So the car, caused an accident. Okay. On the right side, we see one more split, but this time it's the mental and physical, mental and physical versus social. Okay. And so each verb is equally allocated into animate actors like me, into musical, mental and physical events. This makes more sense <laughs> than the other side. And um, in social groupings, we get one more split based on what the animate actor is doing to a person or a object. So make has another feature set where it's a animate actor in a social action on an animate actee. So I made myself lunch, this one I could do. <laughs> uh, have is comprised of animate actors, social actions, and animate actees. I had him paint. Okay. <clears throat> now, interpretation aside, right? What you do is you work your way through the tree. It may or may not make a lot of sense um, because sometimes capturing on mathematical probabilities doesn't make any conceptual sense, right? What we can do is say, how good is this model? Well, just like in logistic regression, because this is a, kind of a slightly modified form of that, it's more chi-square than anything else, but um, you can look at the final predicted outcomes and compare that to the classified outcomes and see how well you're doing. So you could get a tree that does not predict very well and so therefore should not be used to interpret the features of those objects. So what I did here was I made a table of my predictions. So I say predict my tree output. So based on these splits, what would you predict each of my objects to be? Compare that to the actual category for that object. This is a confusion matrix if you're familiar with machine learning. You add up the diagonal, divide by the total, and that will tell you your proportion correct or your accuracy measure. So we're 67% accurate. Is that any good? Well, chance is 33%, so we're doing better than chance. Now, unfortunately, I think a lot of people when they're doing machine learning have some like magic number in their head that accuracy should be, or else it's totally worthless model. This is highly dependent on the task. So if you're doing part of speech tagging, which is another class that I teach, if you're not like in the 90% accurate, you're not doing very well because other benchmark models can easily hit those. But when we're classifying verbs, which is quite influenced by culture, I think 67% is probably pretty good. So it's better than a third's chance. Now, another thing we can do is build our random forest. This is going to help us do variable importance. So the function here is C forest instead of C tree. This is all the same. And then we can grow a big forest. Okay, I don't know why it printed way over here, but basically it says to build a thousand trees. And then this variable here controls how many of these variables it uses to start. Because if we told it to use all the variables, you'll get essentially the exact same analysis. So instead what you do is say, you know what, pick two of them and start there and build a tree from there. And this allows us to get at the fact that some of these variables may be equally important. On that, I'm gonna use the varimp function to calculate the variable importance. And I'm gonna make it conditional so I can get this as kind of partial variance. And I just rounded and printed it out. And so what I can see is the semanticity of the actor, you know, inanimate objects <laughs> versus animate objects. 
uh, is the most important variable. You can interpret these much like R squared. But then the next two are actually, actually equally important. And so we're capturing the fact that it's split on event. And then the other one is just mathematical chance. They are equally important variables to use. The other three, totally worthless. And so this is very elucidating. The other three being worthless is not too much of a surprise since they're not on our picture at all. But this is interesting because otherwise it looks like the last variable in the tree was not very important. And when reality is equal, almost like barely as important as the, the second variable. Okay, so I think this is very important so that we um, can overcome one of the problems with this where um, some variables just win very like minim minimum amounts of variance. You can also make a cute plot. This is just built into the party package. Obviously you could do this a ggplot as well, but it's kind of a nice visualization, right? The numbers are also useful. Cool. Now the forest model is an average of a bunch of trees. And so we might expect that to either be better or worse. So we can do this exact same thing to think about the um, usefulness of our forest model. And it should be very similar, usually just a bit better because you can um, overcome some of the bias due to chance. And so you add up the diagonal and divide by the total. And you see we got about 71%. So we're still doing better than chance. This is kind of like crossfolds, not exactly the same, but it's kind of a similar concept. All right, that's how we do that in R. And the interpretation is the hardest part, especially when it's about verbs. <laughs> but if you think about this for tresses, going back to my, my example, um, what we might find is a surprise. And so we might say, okay, let's look at party dresses, casual dresses, and office wear, right? So we might find that casual is a weird category that overlaps with both of them, where people will kind of relate them because we've spent all year, the last two years, I'm gonna date this, I'm gonna date this video, um, sitting indoors. <laughs> and so there's, I don't feel like, you either go one way or the other, right? You wanna get dressed up because you've been sitting in your pajamas for two years, or you're like, screw it, who cares about dressing up? Um, because I've had too many chips <laughs> the last two years, not speaking from experience. Um, and so you might see that the, there are some surprises in the way that the data is predicted that you weren't aware of. And I think that's really useful because you might figure out a new category that increases sales, right? Um, that you weren't sure was there. Yeah. Now, how do I do this in Python? You don't really, it's not really implemented in Python as far as I can tell when I built these slides. Um, there are decision trees in Python, but not conditional inference trees. And these are different things. So what I'm gonna do is show you the decision tree to talk about why a conditional inference tree is better. These lectures do assume you know a little bit of Python. Um, and what I'm gonna do here is I'm using my RStudio and a Miniconda environment. Um, you can connect it to any version of Python you like, but you, if you are not using our school's server, you should, I really recommend Miniconda. <laughs> uh, anyway, okay. So to create a decision tree in Python, what we're gonna first do in my markdown file is transfer the data from R into Python. Okay. And I love this, it's so great, r.reducedata. So you just do r.name of data frame and it grabs that data from your R environment, pulls it into Python. Okay. So you can have these two environments talk to each other, that's cool. So um, I don't have to do that, I could just, um, I don't have to save it into my Python environment. I could just keep using it, but it is a little bit easier if you pull it in. Okay. Now, first thing I'm gonna do is import scikit-learn because that's where the decision tree classifier lives. From scikit-learn, I'm gonna import tree so I can pull this, um, this function out a little bit easier. I'm also gonna import pandas because pandas is our great data frame function in Python. Now here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take this data set 
And here's how you call a data frame in Python. Right? And so if you say, I want to just use these columns, you create a list of the column names that you're interested in. We do a very similar thing in R where we can catenate a little vector. So give me these four columns. But in Python, you have to make yourself a list, which is indicated by these square brackets. That is what this is. This is just a list of the columns that I want to use. The rest, eh, whatever. Now pandas here, PD, get dummies function. What it does is it converts this from our R data frame, which is a simple, is like a category. So in the R data frame, what we have is the semanticity of the actor. And it says inanimate, animate, inanimate, animate. It's coded as a factor variable or a character string. Unfortunately for the decision tree classifier in Python, we need this to be what's called, um, this is not technically dummy coding, although it's called get dummies. And it makes me a little bonkers as a stat as a statistics person, this is one hot coded. So either way, it is coded in a special zero and one format, okay? And so what we would do, what it does is it transforms that column from being um, a column with a label to the, the column being a, a yes or no. So is this first item uh, a semantic actor or an animate actor? Yes. Is an, hmm. an inanimate actor? No. That's redundant in information personally, but this is how you one hot and code. Okay. And so we've got every possible combination of every category and it's either a yes or a no in these classifications. That is not necessary for continuous data, but for categorical data, you do have to convert it to this format. Awesome. So then I just printed it out so we could look at it. And we did the same thing for the Y variable where we're turning that from into a one column of, of labels to three columns with a yes and no indicator. Cool. Now we create our prediction tree. And the way you do this is you first build a blank model. This is a very common Python trick. We build an empty model and then we fit our data to it. So my empty model here is the decision tree classifier. And I'm a dot fit x comma y. Okay. Another common Python thing is x comma y, whereas in R it's y tilde x. Okay. So pretty easy to fit. So now I have my conditional inference tree with data fit to it. Let's see what's in it. Well, this is why R wins. Not only does it implement the actual conditional inference tree, it actually also prints much prettier. Now there are ways to print this using graph viz, but I found it very um, cumbersome to set up and I could never get it to work properly. But if you're good at that, this does print better with graph viz, right? Um, but you can directly print from the scikit-learn output. So we do tree.export text. You put in the name of your model and then you tell it what, uh, what feature names that you want to see. So I told it to give me all, all the features from my data frame. And here it goes. This is even more difficult to read than the nice pretty R chart. And so we'd look for the first split. The first split is on the animacy of the actor. Okay. So it's less than or equal to 50, which means it's a zero. So this is, um, basically inanimate. And then this one is when it's listed as animate, but then confusing, uh, not confusing, sorry. Um, so animate versus inanimate. Wait, I did that backwards. Animate versus inanimate up here. Okay. And then the mental event is not there. Okay, versus the mental event being there. Class equals one is whatever category is um, first. So I think it's cost. Okay. And so that seems to match, right? Inanimate mental events, but it keeps going. Now, the nice thing about this is it actually will split the categorical split instead of just binary split because it's not the a decision tree is not necessarily a binary splitter like a conditional inference tree, but it doesn't know when to stop. So if we come over here, 
you can see that we've got co-reference and negative in here and possessive, even though we know that those are not useful predictors. And so one issue with the decision tree classifier is that you would have to prune the things that are not predictive other than reading this chart, it's freaking impossible. You can do it, but it gives me more of a headache than trying to remember what a mental, an inanimate actor having a mental event would be. Okay. So I don't think this wins very well, but I do want to show you that they, that when I say that um, a conditional inference tree is better than these other classifiers because in this scenario, because you don't have to prune your tree, this is what I mean. I can also look at my prediction. So let's see how good we do. And this is treated more in a machine learning character um, and machine learning kind of way. So there are no p-values here and there's no effect size, which is quite unfortunate because <laughs> this tree does not do permutation. But let's see, I'll get my predictions by doing um, model.predict. So you have model.bit and model.predict. It's pretty common Python language. Okay, so predict my X variables. Uh, I've given it some column names, right? So that I can look at it. <laughs> uh, Cause it'll predict a zero and one output. So I gotta have tell it which one's cause, which one's have and make. And then here I'm converting this back to a column that has just which one is the best. So this I, I, uh, ID which one max is, is like which max in R where you grab for that row, which column name has the one in it, basically. So we're converting this back to, is it have, is it make, is it cause? So that's my predicted category, my actual category, and converting that one back. Okay. So this is a little frustrating because in R, I did nothing to the data frame, it just was. So in Python, I gotta screw the data frame around to get this information. But then I said, okay, print me out a confusion matrix because a confusion matrix is what we did in R with the little tables. We can see we're doing about the same. Okay, I could compare this to my R table, which I think I printed down here. Right. And they're in the same order, cause, have, make. Okay. So we're not doing as well on some of them and others, but let's just you know print out a classification report. And that gives me my accuracy. And so you'll see here, oops, accuracy. And if you're interested in these other precision recall and F1 scores, you can look at those two. They're different metrics for how well you're predicting each group. Okay, true positives and false negatives, that kind of stuff. Um, to not get into machine learning just yet this semester, I wanna talk just about accuracy and we're actually predicting at the same amount. Okay. So with my forest and my trees in my forest, I got about 71% with only three or four of the variables. In this decision tree model, it used all the variables, I'm still at 71%. <laughs> so you can see that those extra components are not helping us. And so we'd have to prune the tree for not being actually being useful. Okay, in a conditional inference tree, I don't have to do that. All right, so which one should we use? All definitely are in this case. And we'll talk each week about which system is better, which one has the better package. Um, and we'll get to some, some, some weeks where it's, it's definitely Python, but a lot of our models will be able to do equally in both. So there'll be some weeks where it's like, it doesn't matter which one you pick, they're about the same, okay? or a slight edge to this, to this one. Um, a lot more R this semester than in my other course <laughs> where the answer is R doesn't do this. <laughs> so we'll do a little bit of both so that um, depending on your skill set, you could pick which one you like. Okay, so R does make this prediction simpler and easier. Maybe not interpretation, but the prediction part of it. And it does create some pretty charts. Okay. If you are more interested in sort of test, train, apply classification, more traditional machine learning, Python might be a little better. That's what it's set up for. Not that you couldn't do this in a conditional inference tree as well. Okay. So in summary, what did we learn this week? Well, we talked a lot about categories. We're talking a lot about categories next week. So hold on to this stuff. And I think that understanding these cognitive underpinnings to some of these apl applied analyses can really help you think more about why you're getting the results you're getting um, and some different ways to conceptualize some of these tasks that people think about as like sort of business analytics that have very uh, applicable um, research 
in more traditional basic research, right? So um, I think anytime you're talking about keywords and organizing data, categories are pretty important. We also learned about conditional inference trees and random forests. So we might think about what the exemplar is for each category or what features predict each category. And we can use these models when the data is sparse or there's a potential for lots of interactions in the data, meaning that you have to split the data a lot to really tease out which category is which. All right, so if you're in my class, you will now head over to working on a nerd versus geek data set. Otherwise, thanks for listening and see you next week.